it's nice to be able to code. So coding is fun. And it's nice to be able to talk about code. Um, so this is exciting. I also know that this is the last session before drinking, so I'm sensitive to that. And I know that everyone is, is kind of thinking about that. Uh, so if you're responsive and friendly to me, I'll just go right through very quickly and it, it'll be great. But if you're sad and remorseful and, and uh, you're irritating in any way, I'm just going to go slow. and just So just it's an incentive. It's a fair incentive. We all want to drink, so I'm going I'm to leverage that. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about, um, about this, uh, this binding. But actually, I'm going to use it as a vehicle to talk about some other things. Because just talking about a binding is kind of boring. So I'll get some big picture things in here as well. I really, really am passionate about ZeroMQ um, in the same way that I'm really passionate about Erlang because I think that these things dovetail really nicely. So I'm going to kind of use this as a vehicle to, uh, to talk about some non-binding topics. OK. So what we're talking about is an Erlang binding for CZMQ. CZMQ is hard to say, but what it means is it's a C binding for ZeroMQ. So it's a binding of a binding. ZeroMQ is a library. We'll get into what that is. But it's written in C++. And Peter Hinchins, not a big fan of C++, fan of C, a fan of C APIs, wrote a really, really clean and elegant uh, wrapper for ZeroMQ. And I really, really like this wrapper. So I wrapped it with Erlang. Um, so it's, it's a wrapping of a wrapping. OK. But what is a ZeroMQ? How many people here have at least heard of ZeroMQ? Yeah, this is good. This, is, this has not always been the case. How many people have some direct experience using it? This is more typically the case. So much, much fewer hands went up there. Uh, we'll change that. That's, that's going to change over time, because this is really one of those things that deserves to be used. Hopefully, we can inspire some people today. OK, so let's talk a little bit about what ZeroMQ. It started out as the goal. The goal of ZeroMQ started out to be fast. So we want to create something that's super, super fast. And that's what motivates most software programs today, right? The faster, the better. Anything that's slow is terrible. Things that are fast are great. So the vision behind ZeroMQ originally was just to go as fast as possible. But over time, it turned into a sort of a realization that we've created something that we, but they have created something that's really sort of a very elegant messaging API, a very socket-like interface to messaging. And sort of light bulbs went on and said, this is really useful. And it started to take off. And it evolved today into a, a sort of an ecosystem of language support that exceeds 40 languages, like 40, 45 or so. It's probably quite a bit more than that. Um, but if you just look at the supported languages that are, are, are documented, there are many that aren't. It's a quite an impressive list. If there's any language that you're using that isn't on this list, I'd love to know what it would be. I've highlighted some of the more common ones that you would, you would face. But right off the bat, you look at this. And what I hope goes off in your head is that you know, this is a really embracing vision. This is, this is a vision of messaging that extends to everybody. It's not just to Erlang. I mean, we enjoy a lot of amazing advantages in Erlang. Uh, but ZeroMQ extends this to basically everybody. So everybody can start to think and act and use messaging uh, according to this very simple API. I'm going to get into sort of the some of the implications of that, but this is a really, really important vision, I think. All right, so what is, why does this thing matter? Just like in Erlang, using ZeroMQ shifts your focus from building applications that tend to be monolithic, sort of traditional main functions, Java, C Sharp, C, et cetera, into building systems of, 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 of services and, and, and processes that relate, that work together. And if you've written Erlang, programs, you've written systems. You actually don't write traditional programs. You write processes that are wrapped up into application facilities that are started as a part of this VM initialization scheme. It's a system. And a lot of people don't appreciate that, but that's actually what you're doing when you write Erlang programs. We mentioned language diversity. This matters hugely. If you're limited in your audience, you tend to be niche. Erlang is niche. It's very niche. If you've paid any attention to the, the uh, uh, the uh, Erlang list, the mailing list, you see there's been this sort of split almost within the community of people who think that like, it's important to be adopted and used and people who don't care about that. Well, I'm, I'm one who cares about that. I want people to use things that are good. Um, and language diversity is part of sort of an, an embracing and extension of things that are good. That's why, you know, which, which exists in the ZeroMQ community. So as it turns out, messages are very, very valuable as recently demonstrated. That's the extra three billion in, in options at the end there. But we all know about the, the value of messages over the last week or so. 
Um, but in seriousness, apart from the monetary rewards, we know that message passing and message passing architectures are hugely valuable uh, for solving complex problems. And it can be very simple, uh, sort of non-distributed to distributed problems. And again, if you've used Erlang, you know what this means. In the zero MQ, the same sort of dynamic exists, and we'll see what that looks like. All right, so those are some very high-level theoretical why it matters points. Now, I just wanted to like invert this and talk about code because that actually will ho hopefully solidify at least uh, uh, some, of, some, some of the points that, we'll be, that I'll be talking about here. All right, so here, here's a problem. It's a very generic problem. I need to build something, all right? We've all been there before. We need to do something. Okay, well, what do we do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to propose two options. This is the most common option, modify an existing application. Uh, how many people here work with other programmers as a, a part of their, sort of their daily work? Almost everybody. Okay. So when you do that and you're in that type of environment, when you have to solve a problem, you almost always have to deal with some existing code. Right? What am I going to do? It's going to be this web app. It's going to be this web app or that web app. Everything is a web app, right? So in your environment, it's probably a web app uh, if, if you're you know, traditional software environments. Um, but it could be something else that's going to exist, though. Option number two, though, as a contrast, would be to add a service. And I'm going to talk about that. This might not be an obvious dichotomy. But the example will hopefully clarify this. So I want to talk about both of these things. So option number one, modify an existing application. I have inc been increasingly tendent toward leaving stuff alone. Like, I don't like to look at other people's code. I don't like to look at other existing applications. I like to just leave it there. If it's broken, it stays broken. If it's working, it stays working. I just don't, I want to go do something else. Modifying an existing application forces me to become proficient with that application. The language, the libraries, the tools, the patterns, the crazy thinking that went into this and that. And I just don't have the tolerance over the years. I've become increasingly intolerant of existing applications. Um, I don't like to change things because I found that when you change things, it tends to make things worse. Uh, it's maybe an extreme statement, but certainly it introduces that risk, so I like to avoid it. Um, and this is, the, this, is, this is probably my biggest beef with sort of modifying existing code. When you take like, an existing code base and you continue to modify it over time and add features, you are contributing to an, an ever-growing monolith that is intractable interdependencies of code. If you program in Erlang, Erlang encourages you not to do this. If you program in other languages, they almost always encourage you to do this. Has anyone used Java or seen Java and seen what can happen? Java is a language and an ecosystem of, of tooling that really, really encourages just big balls of twine to evolve and become these huge monolithic structures. So I personally like, like services. So what's a service? So a service is, to define it quickly, something that is discrete and standalone and provides some well-defined functionality. I'll talk about what discrete means in a little bit. But when you add a service, you are adding something new, and you can just create it in whatever language you're proficient in, whatever tooling, whatever patterns, whatever is in your brain. You say, this is the problem. I'm going to solve it using blah. And you can think very clearly about it. You don't have to be influenced by some other existing application, code, language, <laughs> framework. You can approach something cleanly using your well-defined problem that you have to solve. You avoid changes to other applications. It's sort of in contrast to the other option. Services allow you to focus your solution. Right? When you have something that's standalone, you can be standalone. You can be focused. That's why I like services. Services are great. And a great services architecture, I don't like SOA, I don't like that term, but we'll use it because it's very common. Um, when you create well-defined, isolated, standalone services, you contribute to an ecosystem. Right. Option one and option two. Very high level, but we're going to use some code right now uh, as, uh, as an example. So the problem that we're going to solve here, this is very specific, is a JSON formatting problem. I want to convert raw JSON into formatted JSON. Very simple. It's an example. Right? But it's a service. It's some sort of functionality that we want to implement. Now, in my brain, I look at this, and, and I, use this, I use this Python to do this all the time. You can do this on the command line, and I use it all the time. You pipe some, some text into python-m json.tool, and it's like a little main. It's like reads from standard in and, and output stuff. It's the easiest way to get formatted JSON that I know of. There might be better ways, but I don't care what you think. I just know it works. So in my brain, it's not Ruby or Java or some you know, thing that Maven spits out or, or a Docker image or whatever. It's just it's Python. It's simple. 
I'm going to ship this thing as a service. And right, I'm going to get an, some actual code here. Whoa, my goodness. So, so it's this big inversion, right? High-level strategy to code. So just bear with me here. We're going to tie this all together. OK, so I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to sort of methodically blow through code here. Now we're going to shift from sort of why it's important, different strategies for solving problems. Is it going to be changing existing applications versus service orientation? And I'm going to dive into some actual zero MQ code. We're going to pop out of this and hopefully see, see what, how this sort of relates. Zero MQ is very code centric. It's very low level. So this is why we're going to use code as an example. And this will give you an idea of what zero MQ is all about in conjunction with this high-level strategy. All right, let's take a look at this, blow for blow. This is Python, it's easy to read. This is a part of a module. I've taken some, of that, some pieces out so we can look at the big picture. This is the big picture. I'm gonna start with the bottom of all things. In Python, this is how you get a script or a, or a module to be executable. You put a little hook in here and it's kind of crufty boilerplate, but if this is run as a script, it will call the start function. This is the interesting part, start function. Zero MQ is a low-level message-oriented library. So it's used for sending and receiving messages. It's in contrast to a large framework like RabbitMQ uh, or other brokering services, uh, the MQ lineage. Uh, typically, they're large applications and they're brokers of some type. So you install some large application and you connect clients to it. The clients you know, participate in some protocol. Messages are routed and distributed, et cetera. ZeroMQ is not this. It's often confused for something like that, but it isn't. It's much more like a socket API, but it's for messages. And in this API, we always start with a context, and this is part of the ZeroMQ library itself. So we create a context, and you can read the, in the docs what that context entails, but this is sort of like the environment for the things that we create. We will then create a socket. In this case, we're going to init socket. I'll, I'll show you what that is in a second, but just read it as a high level. Oh, 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 that's dangerous. This goes fast. Sorry. <laughs> I did that in practice. I'm like, never do that. And here it happened. All right. Uh, 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 uh. It's like a trick that Logitech plays on you. OK, here we go. Don't do that. All right. Initialize the socket. We'll read that in a second. So that's a function of the context. I've got a socket. All right, so I'm going to create the, create the context, initialize the socket, loop forever here, receiving and handling message. This is basically as primitive and basic a service as you can get. I'm going to, I'm going to start listening for something and receive something off of that socket. I'm going to handle that. Straightforward, right? Hopefully. OK, this is some detail here. Initializing the socket in this case is a function of a context. We pass the context in, and this is the API itself. And this is the Python binding, so it's kind of object-oriented. Great. So we do context.socket. That creates a new socket. And this is a socket type. We'll get into socket types in a little bit. This simply means it's a particular flavor of a socket, a message socket. And we'll talk about that later. This is a bound socket, so it's going to actually be sort of a, like a listener. It's going to bind to this all interfaces, that's the star, on port 5555. Right? So we're now listening on a local port. So if you go netstat-na, you'll see that port 5555 is occupied by this particular socket. Print a message and return the socket. Very simple. That's the initialization. So we create it and we create a bind. This is effectively the server side. It's the listener. We'll look at the client side in a second. Handling a message. This is something that we've received off of the so off a socket. This is not a stream. It's not a byte array. It's a message. It's an opaque binary. And that's really the difference between 0MQ and traditional socket, socket uh, interfaces. In 0MQ, you deal with messages. They're binaries, just binary blobs, very simple. They're not streams. 0MQ uh, provides certain guarantees that you get the entire binary. So you don't have to worry about all the plumbing associated with sending and receiving opaque blobs of data. That's what 0MQ does for you. So I got this thing. I'm going to handle it as I got message. Now, this is where the, 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 the work is done here. I'm going to call format JSON. We'll see what that looks like in a second. That's the raw data that's being passed. And I'm going to send, I'm going to send a response back on the same socket. So the socket is used as the receive and the send. If I have an exception, it's going to send an error. And I'm using a little prefix here to suggest to, uh, to imply good. That's a plus. So this is a good, good response. And the negative is a bad response. It's a very ad hoc API that I created, simple, direct. There's no crazy thrift or, or other complex encodings. It's just a string. And this is, this is the sample. 
All right, so that's the basic flow. Does that all make sense? Very, this, this library is very, very simple. It encourages you to think simply. And it's remarkable that when you think simply, amazing things can happen. And this has been my sort of DAO experience with, with this library. And then very quickly, the format JSON. This is taking the existing functionality in the Python JSON. So I went in and I read the code that does the, 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 the pipeline, this reads from standard out, and I just basically put it in here. All right, so that was a, a quick hack, very simple. I'm going to load this thing. This is a, an odd name for taking the raw, unformatted JSON, and we convert it into an object that's an internal representation within Python. Some formatting options, whatever. And this is now converting this using the formatting options into a formatted string. Simple? Super simple. All right. That's why I picked this example, because it's super simple. That's the service. That's it. This is done. This is code. I'm going to show this code running in a second. Can you believe it? That's a service. That's like so simple. All right. Here's, here's, here's Erlang. Everybody's like, thank you. Oh, but Python is so, it's so hard to deal with. That return statement bothers me so much. And it should indeed bother you. This is much better. I feel, you just feel safer, doesn't it? You're in a safe place now. We can all relax and breathe. Like, oh, my code is going to work. I don't have to worry about this stuff. No, Python's great. Come on. Python's great. OK, so this is going to be written in eScript. This is written in eScript. So this is the story here. I like to, I like to think about code as stories. And I can really tell great stories with, with, uh, with functional languages, and especially your language. It's so simple. I'm going to initialize a state. Don't worry about what that is. It's some state. We'll look at it in a second. I'm going to make a request. The raw input is being passed on the command line as an option. Right There it is, raw. Mirrors the service. That's the raw JSON, and there's some state. Right? We're all used to state. We don't look like to look into state because it's messy. That's right. You, that's the way you want to look at it. And then after I've made the request, I do a cleanup. So this is a command that I'm going to execute. It's going to run. It's going to quit. Simple. So here's the request. I've got the raw. Now, this is the state that's getting passed in. It's a little leaky, but whatever. It's simple. Um, there's a context here. We'll see that in a second. But this is the socket that's, that was initialized in init state. Here's the code. This is the library that we're talking about. This is why we're here today, because we're allegedly interested in these four letters here, ZCMQ. This is it in action, finally. It's in Erlang. It's happening. ZC, sorry, CZMQ. I, do I, tip, I type that incorrectly about every, every, every other time. Um, this is a, a function that is going to send a simple string. It's a string. It's not simple. It's just a, st a string on the socket. So here's, here's the socket, and here's the raw. That's it. And we're asserting that it's going to succeed. We're going to then receive back on the same socket, and with a timeout of a second, and we're going to handle the result. Again, very simple, send and receive. So in the service, we did a receive send, and not surprising, on the client, we did a send receive. And so this is a basic request response implementation. All right? Everyone with me? All right? Good. Excellent. No case expressions, by the way. So you don't need them. Don't need them. Uh, OK, where are we? In its state. Again, we're looking at the API. We're learning how to use the API here. So in this case, the context is a start link. This is idiomatic in Erlang. If you don't know this by now, you should know this quickly. This is very, very common. I'm starting a process, and it's linked to the existing process. That's what that means. That gives me my context. I'm asserting a success here. I'm using this context to create a socket. And I'm using this API, CZMQ, ZSocket. This is a little bit strange here, but I'll show you later. The goal of this library is to mirror the C API. So you, it might not look, it looks a little like a C API. But that's by design. Um, there's, a, there's a reason for that, and I'll explain it. But just go with it. ZSocket new. This is going to create a new socket with the context, and this is the socket type. It's a request type. The other one was a reply type. Just go with it. Just flow here. I'll explain all it later. I'm going to connect. The other one was a bind. I'm going to connect here. This is the same idea as listening on a socket, and, and you have a, have a connector that's connecting. This is, this is essentially a client function of the socket, and here is the address. The other one was bound to all devices. That was the star. This one is connecting to local host on the same port. So I'm expecting a connection to succeed here. And then I return the, the, the tuple here as the state, because I'm interested in both of these for cleanup. That's the state. There it is. We've revealed it. OK. Didn't we say what? Oh, yeah, request. I, I've duplicated this, so I don't need to do that. All right, so forget this part. We've already seen this. This is the handle. Oh, I did it for context. Handle receive. 
So we're going to send this out and receive immediately, and we're going to expect one of three results here. I got a success with a plus, I got a success with a minus, and I get an error of some type. And we have different handlers for each of these. So if it's good, I'm going to print, print the reply. If it's bad, I'm going to print an error. Yeah, straightforward? OK, so we've seen a simple service, we've seen a client, and we've seen the API in action. It doesn't actually get any more complicated than this. You just add more of these things in, in other interesting patterns. But the code that you write in this paradigm is, should be, indeed, very, very simple. You can extend this into production systems. This is not an oversimplification. It's just simple. All right. OK, so who wants to see the demo? The demo. We want a demo, right? Of course, we want to see, if wor Let's see this working. Of course. OK. So let me show you the actual code. OK, so this is the, this is the Python service. Here it is. It's, it's all of that. It's what? I actually added some stuff. So it's, uh, what are we doing? We're you know, 30, 38 lines with white space. OK, here's the eScript, the Erlang, right? And that's it. Super simple. OK, so I'm going to start the service. So it's going to look like this, right? Listing on port 5555. Okay, so that's an actual bound port there. This isn't magic. It's actually listing on a, a TCP socket. So at the end of the day, we're talking about network traffic, so don't, don't freak out here. All right, so let's run our client. So let's pass in a number. All right, that's valid JSON. Okay, so here we say, sorry about that. If you can just see over here, got one, two, three. Here, let's do this, sorry. That's Possibly my fault. Yeah, there we go. Okay, got one, two, three, and this is the this is the format of JSON. Not terribly exciting, but let's pass in something like this. All right. Okay, I got the raw string unformatted. I got back formatted. That's what this thing does. One more, just because it's so much fun. All right, foo, one, two, three. OK, convinced. Does anyone doubt at this point? You're all convinced. You're believers that this works. OK, so I passed in some invalid JSON there, and I got no JSON object could be decoded. All right, simple. If you put this up on the web, then we could send our JSON to be formatted. You could, you could. I could, I could charge for it. I could monetize. I could like ad, have advertising for this <laughs> and retire. Within, as, long as, I, as long as I had 450 million users, I think I could monetize this with Facebook <laughs> successfully, very successfully. Yeah. Okay. So, look. All right. So, what do we just see here? Let's just summarize this in, in pictorial form. This is a Python process. It's listing use a, using a particular flavor of a socket called a reply. REP stands for reply. And it's bound to this port. We started up an Erlang process. It has a corresponding request. Uh, socket type, which is then communicating uh, over uh, TCP IP, sending raw JSON up to the service and converting it back. It, it, it isn't honestly getting any more complicated. You are truly understanding everything you need to understand right now. All right. So let me, let me throw a counterpoint up here, because I know some of you are like, why are we building services here for JSON conversion? Right. So all of this just to format some JSON, why don't we just use a library? Right. Why don't we just use Python? Why do we have to run a service to do this? Like you're talking about deploying these programs and having networks and having operations and, and making sure that these things are running and available. Are you kidding me? For JSON formatting, you're insane. Right? Libraries, you can just distribute them anywhere. You don't have to like run them on a particular server. These are all va valid points. So here, here are my responses. First of all, it's just an example. It could be much more complex than this. This could be inter doing all sorts of interesting things. This is the essence of the service-oriented architecture. You can have simple services. You can have complex services. But let's just, for argument's sake, assume that I just want to format JSON in all actuality. It's not an example. It is something that I want for my business. It's a service that I want. Operations is something that you have to deal with. But you have to deal with it at some level. And if you have to deal with it at some level, you should be able to deal with it at another level. If you have to deploy a web application, you need some strategy around DevOps and operational management. And maybe we aren't as good as we should be at getting services deployed and maintained and monitored. But this is a function of time. Over time, we will become more and more efficient 
as dev, you've heard of DevOps, right? DevOps is so big, it's huge. It's like you should just have it on your T-shirt and stamp it on your, DevOps is, the conferences in DevOps are not 300, they're like 3,000. And, and, and they're like companies and ecos, like markets are being driven on that. It's going to get better. So uh, yes, it is complicated to deploy a service, but it will become less complicated over time. Here's my point though. Libraries actually don't scale when it comes to programming expertise. So remember that option of having to go and, and modify existing code. Remember you have to modify existing code, what do you need? Language expertise. You need to know about the libraries. In this case, I didn't, know, didn't, need, I didn't need to know anything that I didn't already know. I got to pick. And who cares what, what's under the covers? That service is deployed and it's available and it's useful. And I wrote it. And I don't care if somebody doesn't like it. If you don't like it, throw it away and write it in Perl. It's like this much code in this particular example. So small and focused, you can almost just think of it as throwaway. Right? It, it frees everybody to sort of solve problems, whether you're an individual or a team, to solve problems as you see fit. I think that scales, you know, as opposed to shipping libraries for performance reasons or, or because you don't like operations, I think there's a lot of merit to throwing services up there because you can solve them quickly. You can, uh, you can address the problem in any sort of diverse, heterogeneous environment. All right, and more important than anything in the world is this idea of discrete. What I mean by discrete is you have a service that's running out there. What is that service? It's bound to a port. It's really, really specific. In this case, it's an operating system process. You can go kill nine it. It has a boundary. Um, it, it has an API, right? It has, it has an interface. You send something up and you get something back. It's all very well defined. You can move it around. It's independent. You cannot say that about a library. You cannot say that about some block of code. Blocks of code tend to get entangled. Right? You cannot just pull them out. You cannot just shut them down. You cannot just move them around. But services, you can. It's a very important step to moving away from monolith into ecosystem. And 0MQ is a library, 40 plus languages, <laughs> folks, that can enable this, just like, it doesn't, just like Erlang enables it. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly summarize here the zero MQ approach to, to software. If you haven't guessed, it's sort of microservice oriented. Focused, discrete processes that you can run, service orientation. There's a, 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 an online document written by Peter Hinchins called The Guide. Zero MQ follows this. There's a bunch of patterns of messaging patterns in there. And at the end, I'm gonna encourage you, it's gonna call to action to go read that thing. But there's a bunch of patterns in there that illustrate ways to solve problem using messaging. Patterns in the guide are based on socket types. Let's quickly run through some socket types. ZeroMQ works as, as we've seen with sockets. So you create some sockets and you send messages. The sockets have flavors, they have different characteristics. The mother and father socket types, like the, the top of the pyramid here, are the router dealer. And this is getting into ZeroMQ jargon or nomenclature. And when you read the guide and when you read the documentation, these will become very familiar. But very quickly, a router is effectively acts as a server and a dealer effectively acts as a client. In ZeroMQ, there is really no distinction between client and server. It's a very freeing idea. We think of client and server primarily because it's a very common request response protocol we deal with, the web. There's a server, there's a client. In ZeroMQ, anything can be a server and any, anything can be a client. But it's helpful to think about this at times as something that handles a request from, uh, some sort of central thing that handles requests from dealers. These, these names, if you read the guide, you'll see what Peter, how P Peter views them. I tend to view them as client-server. That may be a little di diluted, but it works for me. You start up a router, you start up a dealer. The dealer has an ID. So the dealer sends a message in and the router can send back specifically to the dealer. Is that, that is the most complicated facility of these types. Every other socket type is a derivative of this. Request response is simply, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, create a, a, a reply socket here and a request socket over here, and it means that request says, I wanna send a request and I wanna reply immediately. The reply expects to receive something and sends it back. So it's a request response uh, type uh, um, interchange here. And you'll see that these types tend, they, they pair up with one another. They typically pair up. So you'll have one type and another type and they'll pair up. 
and you use these, these pairings to create different patterns in your topology, in your messaging topology, and you use that to solve problems. Another common one is push-pull. This is basically you just want messages to go in a single direction. Right? That's a very common pattern. You're just sending messages back. So this might be a logging service where you're collecting things and you're just sending things. It's kind of UDP-ish. Okay, that's it, really. I mean, that's, there's, a, there's a few others, but that's pretty much it. Um, and the guide will show you how to use these things. It's kind of like the Zero MQ Bible. Okay. So that's a whirlwind tour of Zero MQ and the ideas behind Zero MQ and some of the practicals of Zero MQ. Contacts, sockets, sending messages. I can stop right there. That's basically all you need. You can start to use this today. Like, 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 don't drink beer, just like go create services, it's so much fun. <laughs> so let's talk about the, the binding here. So now we're gonna move into Erlang world and, and, and this particular binding, this library. Okay, it's an external C port. It's very strange to see a binding written this way. I often don't know, maybe Richard knows, uh, or others know here, if there are other sort of tra traditional language or, or driver bindings that use external ports. Typically, I've seen, obviously, NIFs and, and, uh, and built-in drivers. Um, the reason I did this was I used to use, see the other, the, there's some other libraries that interface the zero MQ written as, uh, as NIFs or other, other linked drivers. And the problem with any of these is if there's the slightest problem with them, they'll bring your entire Erlang VM down. Now, I don't know why you use Erlang, but if it's not to stay up and running, um, you, I'd like to know what the use case is. Um, maybe you just like the syntax, I don't know. I mean, the syntax is good. I, like, I actually do like the syntax. I'm not sure it would be my first choice, but I certainly use Erlang because I want my software to run. That's it, that's the primary reason. And the reason it runs is it is predicated on, on fault isolation. Right? You have process isolation, and if there's a fault within one of these, it's isolated and it doesn't affect the other processes. Why on earth would you subject that beautiful architecture to some library that is peppered with assertions. Zero MQ, if you look at, if you just go and grep assertion or assert, you'll see they're everywhere. It's basically just the way they handle errors. Assert, boom, crash. So if you use these NIFs, if you use Zero MQ in Erlang, you have to supervise your Erlang process. You should anyway, but your, your, your process, your Erlang process will go down all the time. It just will. And what I mean all the time, if you're running it continuously, Depending on your situation, it might go down and have to be restarted, you know, either multiple times a day, multiple times a month, but it will definitely go down. So I don't like this. I, I, it's bizarre to me that, that. so we'll see that I, I'm, I'm really opting for, for safety over performance. You'll see the performance on this thing. It's, 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 uh, it's fun to see. Okay, highlights of this. All functions are available through a single module, so it's very simple to use. It mirrors as much as we possibly can the upstream <laughs> CZMQ API, and this is very much by design. So those weird function names, zsocket underscore blah, 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 that comes right out of the documentation. I want folks to be able to read the upstream documentations, become familiar with that API, and be able to use it here. So there's a synergy. I don't want to reinvent something just because it's more idiomatic Erlang. In this particular case, I think the C API is perfectly fine, it's very elegant, it's well done, and I think it reads cleanly. It certainly reads a lot more cleanly than a lot of other Erlang code. So you might get a little bit bothered by some of the verbosity and some of the C API-ishness of it, but that is by design, and you should be happy. I, I think you should actually be happy about that. Okay, so this thing is steady, uh, but it is, it is what they call slow as a dog. It is um, <laughs> relative to some other things. But the initial fo focus, and this is, should be true, I think, of any, of any software that you write, should be on, it should work. Right? should work first and foremost. Um, it, and, then, and then maybe it goes faster if you need it to go faster. So that's the approach. There's been no optimization on this, um, but it's not that bad. It's not that slow. Okay. The way an external port is implemented uh, is you have your Erlang VM and you start, literally start an external OS process. It's not an internal Erlang process. It's like, another, like PS-EF. You can find the process running. You can kill it. It's a separate OS process, and it communicates over standard I.O. So it's a request response protocol you s typically send, in this case, with this, this uh, implementation, you send a command over, and you reply over, sta over standard in in input. And that's the way an external port works. 
The advantage of this is that as these are separate processes, if there's a problem over here, who cares? You lose this state. Big deal, it's a message, it's a message portal. Who cares, there's, all, there's no state here anyway, hardly any state. All of your precious processes, all the code that you want to work is still working here in beautiful isolation land, and it doesn't matter. And you can supervise this, if it crashes, you restart it. It's really, really nice. The problem that a lot of people have is they just think, oh, this is so terrible, how oh, slow, this pipe is just so bad and slow, I want to niff, I, wanna, I, I want to, I want this thing to go as fast as possible. And I really don't care if my code crashes. I, do, I don't get, I don't understand that. Maybe speed is important at times. We're gonna see that there's a big difference though. There's, there's a trade-off to be made. Okay, CZMQ, very quickly, is a very clean, Peter Hinchins, uh, I, 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 I want to be uh, like him when it comes to programming. He's a really uh, mature and, and understands the, 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 the the beauty of simplicity, driving something and making it as simple as possible. This is one of the, the most clean and elegant APIs that I've, I've run across. So I, I, I wanted to reflect it. I wanted to use that. It wraps a ZeroMQ library, which is a lot more than a wire protocol. We've been in a list, uh, we've been talking about ZeroMQ, and there's a pure Erlang implementation. That's great if you just want the wire protocol and want to duplicate all of the work of the core libraries. That's, that's, that's fine, but to me, that's a lot of work. Why would you do that if you could just leverage what, what is existing? Um, I, there are some advantages. You know, pure, pure, uh, pure, you know, you don't have to deal with this weird port interface thing. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done to, to maintain syn synchronization across the, uh, and keep up, up to date. You see, you'll always see that these pure, uh, these pure bindings are, are lagging in, 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 in uh, features, functionality, performance, et cetera. Um, Mainly I'm lazy here, I don't, I don't want to write that, so I just want to wrap this thing. CZMQ is closely attended to, and it has some security features. So looking at all the different options, I think CZMQ is, a very, is the right one to work with. It's just this nice, clean interface, and it's first class. Peter's working on it directly, so that's, that's what you get with this binding. Okay, where are we at here time-wise? Okay, was it a 15 minute talk? So we have 10 minutes left? Oh, all right, I'll skip this stuff then. I thought I had an hour. These people, they don't tell me anything. Come on now. No, I, I, I should know. Okay, so uh, look, very quickly here, you can see this if you go into the, into the documentations and the samples. But these are, these are examples of the sends. Here, here's some of the receives. Right? They're fairly straightforward. Um, each has a slightly different vari variation. Uh, because we're t talking about a, an external port, we cannot block on any operations. Any blocking operation freezes up everything. So because ZeroMQ is, has, non has, has non-blocking operations, we use those. And we simulate blocking <coughs> using processes within Erlang. Right. So we have a polling facility which will pull. Right. So we can't get push notifications from an external port. We have to make a request and we get a response. So the only way to get that is through polling. Um, but there's an efficient polling mechanism, so it's not terrible. There's some future... Um, blocking simulations using f uh, polling. Okay. Observations. I'm sorry. Yeah. What you said about can't get, you can't get pushed. <laughs> so the, the model of CCM Q sockets where, where you, can, you know, publish a subscriber, whatever it is, that just can't, that isn't done here? It's certainly done. It, it, you, you get all of that, um, but you get it through an Erlang interface, which is doing polling in the back, back end. If you look at most code examples in, in 0MQ, they're polling. All, I mean, th it's the most common approach. You pull, you go into a loop, and you either block, uh, or you, you block on a receive, or you, you don't block, and you do a wait. And you can, you can that, that, that polling increment. The thing is, when when messages arrive in 0MQ, they will collect the messages. So it's not like the messages are being blocked. And when you do a poll, it collects all the messages that are currently le have landed. So if you get 1,000, you'll get 1,000 back right away. And then, so you're, you're, you're incrementing polling. So you get some latency in there, but that latency is generally not, generally not an, an influence of your application. If you want performant message handling, you don't, I don't even think you want to use Erlang. I think you want to, if, 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 that, if things are that important from a performance and latency standpoint, writing something in C is not that hard. And, and then you can use, you can write a C program that has all the efficiencies that you want, then you interface back to Erlang uh, through a, a higher level interface over, over an external port. That's the way I would approach that. Okay, 
This is a very small library. If anyone here wants to like add things to this, please just go do it. It could be a pull request. It's super easy to do. Um, this is a very light touch around CZMQ, and that's intentional. I found that these libraries that are complex are hard to maintain, they're hard to get right. So this is straightforward. I think there's a, a lot of payoff with a relatively small amount of code. It's slow, relatively speaking, but it's solid, and we we're, we're currently have a, a pretty uh, stable API. I've mentioned the maintenance issues here. OK. There are a couple other sort of prominent ZeroMQ libraries. There's the NIF, that's Erl, Erl ZMQ2, and then there's EasyMQ, which is pure Erlang. To give you a feel for the performance here, now remember I told you that this thing is, quote, slow as a dog. This is a, um, explain this graph here. We have a send, this is using a sender and a receiver in the respective languages. So this is a receiver, the first one is a receiver, the second one is a sender. And basically the receiver sits there and the sender just pounds it with messages and then you count to see how many messages are landing per second. If you use pure C, like this is just as fast as you can go in this particular scenario, you're up over 1.2 million, so it's quite good. If you use C as a receiver with Earl, Z, Earl ZMQ, this is the NIF, it's about half that. That's incredible, that's very fast. So if you want speed in Erlang, this library is the one to use. You will sacrifice stability of your system, though. It absolutely will. I've used this for years, and it just is the case. Um, this thing had a problem with send, so it didn't show up. It's very, very low. I've probably configured something wrong here. Um, the, I need to probably check that. It may actually be that slow. I don't know. Um, something weird was going on there. Um, so here's this library. This is the one we're talking about. It's, <laughs> it's pretty bad. But if you come back here, oh, sorry, the next slide will, will show uh, the numbers here. And th this, is, this flips it. So we're, we're, uh, C is the sender, and then with the library is the receiver. So you can basically see the takeaway here is that Earl ZMQ, ZMQ is quite fast. Being half a C in Erlang is pretty good. Of course, it's a NIF, so you pay a, a penalty on stability. The library we're talking about here is relatively very, very, very slow. So if performance is an issue, um, I would first ask you to look at the actual numbers. So this is still serving tens of thousands of mes messages per second. No, it's not 1.3 million in C, but if you need that sort of performance, latency, throughput you know, characteristic, go right in C. It's not that hard. So even, right t even today, I can use this in production. Th these numbers are more than sufficient for the throughput. And if I need more, I can, I can spin up more, more external processes. Uh, more, more ports and run these things, things in parallel. So distribute, distribute. Okay, what's going on in the future? Um, the API is not complete. It is, it is usable though. Um, and if you need to add things, it's a very straightforward process. So if you need to put something in, it's mechanical. Um, and you know, if, you, if you need functionality, I'd be happy to do it. Or I think if you look at it, it's, it's easy to do. So that's the first priority though, complete the, uh, the API. We want to make sure it's stable, get the type specs written and docu documented, uh, community use, feedback, improvements, and then finally performance. And there are some ways we can improve the performance. And that's on the, it's on, it's on the roadmap. But you know, until somebody says this is a problem, I'd like to see a problem and then somebody solve it specifically and know it goes faster for a reason, rather than just making something fast for the sake of, of benchmarks, like some companies like to do. OK. Um, I've got six minutes left, so I can wrap up very quickly here and get some time for some questions. If you want to get started, it's very simple. Get this library from GitHub. I have a reference here that will point you in the right direction. Number two, run make check. It will compile and run tests. I use tests to document functionality. The tests that I have in here are readable. It's fun to read. It's like a tutorial. Do this, then this, then this, then this. Ah, okay. So it's not like a bunch of blind assertions where it looks like a matrix that some, you know, some sort of assembly, assembly generated. It's actually legible and it's fun. Th fourth and final, because this this will take this will take all of ten minutes. Get, go online and read the guide. I have the reference here to it. It is fantastic. It will open your eyes up to a world of this messaging stuff, uh, and show you different patterns for solving problems and. and, and Peter, Peter writes with a very entertaining style. It's a great read. It will, it will, I believe it will change things for you. OK, and then you can start to use this thing. Mo no monoliths, evolutionary, service-oriented, orient adding things to add new functionality. Uh, that guide will point you down that road, um, and you can use Erlang with this library. Here's some references. We'll skip that. Um, quick summary. I think this is important stuff. 
I think that the early community needs to embrace more languages. I think we need to be able to communicate more effectively with other language groups, and zero MQ is a really easy way to do that. I think we need to think more in terms of service orientation and systems of software rather than monolithic applications. Lots of Erlang developers come from different language camps and they try to apply those points to Erlang. It's a mistake. We need to unlearn these things and start to think in terms of very small, pointed, service-oriented or process-oriented solutions that are all orchestrated in a system. And Erlang is beautiful at that. ZeroMQ enables the same picture, the same story in other languages. So folks that you work with at these companies who don't like to, to, you know, to think about new things, ZeroMQ will enable new things for them. You will get to work with them. You will be happy to work with them. You might even be able to use Erlang professionally because you can just write a service and talk to it with all these other languages. You can just write it in Erlang. And you can write a, a service in Erlang just as easily. So this is a really, I think, a very important enabler for, for a, a brave new world of sanity. This is my point of view. I, 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 I'm willing to, to debate you over beer, like, in two minutes. OK. We have a reasonable amount of time for questions. Yeah? Are there any protocol-specific helpers for building protocols within Shipover There's a, Yeah, so the question is, are there any helpers to, to, uh, def, to define protocols? Um, the only protocol, so there's a wire protocol for 0MQ, and then there's the payload issue. So what kind of binary formats are you going to ship over? And the schools of thought are, you know, write a very efficient pr uh, binary format on, on your own a wire, a, a, for your payload. Or use JSON or XML. I don't use XML ever. Um, or there's things like Thrift or Protobufs or other, you know, BERT, things that you can encode binaries. Um, it depends on the application. But JSON is a really, really smart starting point because it's as ubiquitous as anything gets. Yeah, so the question is about security. Um, CZMQ comes with uh, some uh, support for LibSalt, or LibSodium, uh, which is an encryption, a very fast uh, encryption library. And if you read the CZMQ documentation, you'll see, what the, you'll, you'll see what's in there. Um, this library does wrap that. There are tests to show that it basically um, uh, you, you certificates that, use, uh, that encrypt message, the pay, uh, encrypt uh, the payload. Um, and decrypt. So that's all documented in the CZMQ stuff. It's reflected here. Um, so if you want security out of the box, this is a nice, fast way to get it. Otherwise, you have to do your own encryption and you ro roll your own security, which is fine too. It just happens to be out of the box here. So um, the question is, he's emphatically agreeing with me and stating how awesome I am. Um, I agree with that. I, I think that you make an excellent point there. Um, no, I mean, the point actually is, th is that there's a, there's a split between uh, Erlang and C. It's designed. Erlang is not designed to go fast. It's designed to be stable and run. Um, it has excellent interfaces to programs that go fast in C. And the external port is one of those. And it's a really good mental model to carry. Stop talking about Erlang being slow. Don't, don't say that anymore. Don't think that way. It's designed to be stable. It happens to be slower than a lot of things. But if you need speed, write it in C. It works fine. Uh, this external port interface is a beautiful way to uh, write performant code and, and, tran and, and communicate at whatever level you want to, whatever level is important, over standard I.O. Don't get hung up over that. If you want to write sockets, fine. You can use 0MQ. But the standard I.O. external port interface is a very, very nice approach to solving stability versus speed. And I, your observation about my awesomeness was right on the money. I'm just kidding. Um, next question. So the question is about uh, flow control and, and buffering. And the library indeed buffers. 
Um, and there are different ways of managing uh, uh, the, um, there are ways of discarding messages after a certain amount, and there's, a, there's tuning, uh, there's a b bunch of options that you can use for tuning uh, ZeroMQ, which are all available. Um, there are some baby some options that are not exposed in this binding, but they're easy to add. Uh, but yes, absolutely, this is a very nice buffer or, or, or interface to the outside world. And what's also nice is that if there happens to be a problem, you can, you can actually spin off different contexts and say, this one is going to be isolated for this particular message type or this type of, 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 of traffic type. And if it blows up, it blows up, and you can restart it. And if other ones are, you know, and, and other, other interfaces remain isolated and separate for that. So, so it also gives you a degree of control um, over the type of flows, the type of messages that you're, you're working with, all within Erlang. Yeah. And zero MQ. And some, some, some uh, application developers say zero MQ is faster than all and good. It can be designed. So they do take the zero MQ. I think there's a lot of policy on this discussion. And of course, I think, I think, there's, I, I think I can explain something. But I'd like, I'd like to have your explanation of why two, those, those are two different things are totally different with each other. So if I can summarize the question, it's about distributed Erlang versus the use of some other uh, networking protocol, in this case, ZeroMQ, as an all possible alternative. Um, I look at the distributed Erlang as a convenient way to distribute Erlang, um, but it's, it, it comes with a very specific networking working topology that is toxic in some environments. Um, if you get up to 60 nodes or so, you, know, you, have a, you have a fully connected mesh, and this is the problem with that. Um, it's very it's straightforward and easy within relatively low node counts, and you can partition those. But you you get what it is, and it is what it is. And so you look at that and use it for what you need it need to. I don't think that there's one. I wouldn't say always use zero MQ for for distribution. I don't like distributed Erlang because I think it's easy to communicate over sockets anyway. Um, I like the partition. I like the fact that you know something is outside of yourself. This sort of, you know, I don't know, care or know where a process is running kind of bothers me. But that's me. Lots of really great software is written using distributed Erlang. Um, so I think you need to look at your application and understand your requirements and then understand the specific technical advantages and disadvantages of, the, of, of both of those options. So there's no religion there other than science. You do what's right for your particular, you, you understand your problem um, and then you solve your problem using the most appropriate you guess, and, and yeah. I have no idea. That's a good question. And you're, you, you, please help me on that. Yeah, no, we can work together. Um, Benoit has been, been point, has actually been using this or looking at it and sending me issues, and so I appreciate that. And we, they're all resolved, by the way, now. That, that thing that you were running into was actually not a problem. But, but the question was, uh, was about using threads within the context. And there's a lot of performance uh, tuning that you can do within, within the ZeroMQ context, within that external process. I haven't looked at any of that. The, the first goals have been just to get the API, get things working correctly so you can use this safely in an environment. But I think w when it comes to performance, there's a lot of things that we can improve on. But I like to do that as we understand why we're doing it and, and that we actually need to do it and, and do it intelligently, smartly. I don't like performance for the sake of, of metrics, of, of statistics, of graphs, if you, if you if maybe, maybe not have realized that, but I don't like that. <laughs> okay, so we are over, and uh, I appreciate everyone staying a full four and a half minutes into your drinking time. Um, so thank you.